Welcome to the Cuban Heritage Collection. My name is Maria Torino, and I'm chair of the collection. And I'm really so very happy to uh, welcome you specifically to the Roberto Sigo Sueta Pavilion. Um, and that you all came tonight uh, to view our spring exhibition, but really to commemorate the life and the legacy of Maestro Manuel Ochoa. We recognize him for his contributions in the world of music. So why are we here in a library? To remember him, I'm going to try to answer that question. <laughs> um, the Cuban Heritage Collection is both an archive and a library holding millions of pages of Cuba's history and culture dating back 500 years, but also documenting the Cuban experience of the present, both on the island and in the diaspora. Behind this wall are thousands and thousands of books, magazines, newspapers, photographs, maps, and archives, and during the day, this room that we're in right now is actually a very quiet reading room where students and scholars from all over the world carry out research, discovering and exploring the rich resources held here. I'm often asked, what's the most important book or document that we hold? But the truth is that our most valuable treasures are not the individual objects that we have collected over the years. What is most important is the stories that those materials tell. Stories like that of Maestro Manuel Ochoa. Stories that will always be remembered because thanks to the generosity of Sofia and Manuel Jr., Maestro Ochoa's photographs, music scores, clippings, letters, and other materials have a permanent and safe home here at the Cuban Heritage Collection. The former chair of the collection, Esperanza de Varona, worked closely with Sofia to ensure that Maestro Ochoa's legacy would not only be preserved here, but also that it would be shared with our students and with our community. For example, the Ochoa Archive has been used for class projects by students in musicology courses here at UM, and materials from the collection have also formed part of a Cuban theater a collection that covers the periods of the 1960s and the 1970s, it's an online exhibition. And now we're sharing selections from the archive in the exhibit, um, in our exhibit hall that if you didn't get a chance to see it as you were coming in, we hope that you'll take the time to take a look as you, as you leave today. Maestro Ochoa's legacy lives on in the Miami Symphony Orchestra he founded and in the lives that he touched through his various cultural activities. But it also lives on here in the library where through his own papers, his life, his work, and his passion can be discovered. So it's now my pleasure to introduce to you Mayolette Mendez, who is the Cuban Heritage Collection librarian, and she is the person who organized the exhibition. Good evening, everyone. My name is May Mendez, and as Maria said, I'm the librarian here at the Cuban Heritage Collection. For the past several months, I've had the pleasure of working on this exhibit, and I'm very happy to be finally uh, able to share it with you. We started planning this exhibit a year ago, and from the first moment I sat down with Sofia Ochoa, I knew this would be a great way to commemorate Maestro Ochoa's legacy. One of the most interesting things about uh, curating an exhibit like this is that one becomes immersed in the person's life and their work. 
In this particular uh, case, I had the fortune of working directly with Maestro Chua's papers, photographs, and scrapbooks. The scrapbooks in particular are a gold mine of information. Um, assembled by his sisters, they provide a glimpse into his past that has all been, by, uh, all, been all but erased from Cuban history, uh, music history. <coughs> Equally important was Sofia, who was a committed and passionate partner in this exhibition. And one of the most exciting aspects of working on this exhibit was the opportunity to bring to life Maestro Choa's entire career. Although deservedly well known and praised for establishing and leading the Miami Symphony Orchestra for almost 20 years, there's a part of his work that's not as well known and I thought the more I learned about it, the more I really wanted to share it. While researching and delving into his collection, I discovered a person who was passionate about music and music education. Um, <coughs> he loves sharing that passion with others. I learned about his mother, who was herself a trained opera singer and much in demand in the Guinea sale. I learned also about how Maestro Choa was only 17 when he conducted his first concert and how he traveled to Havana and eventually to Europe to further his education. These travels laid the foundation for the work that would come to define his legacy, and I found it fascinating. In contemporary newspaper accounts <coughs> from the 1950s, his return to Havana from Europe from his studies um, was described as triumphant in the cultural scene. He made an impact on his return. One of the most consistent threads in his life and career was his engagement with teaching. He was a professor of conducting in Havana, and he was active as choral director at several Havana schools and in Miami. He was also deeply passionate about participating and taking a leading role in the cultural life of his adopted city. In Miami, he created the Hispanic Society for the Arts, embracing the city's multi-ethnic heritage in the 70s and 80s. I am very grateful to have had the opportunity to learn so much about Maestro Choa through this exhibit and share with you the many other ways in which he contributed to our culture, both in Cuba and in Miami. That being said, I want to introduce to you uh, Manuel Ochoa Jr., who's going to uh, spare a few minutes with us to tell us a little bit more about his father. Thank you all very much for coming. On behalf of my mother, Sophia, and I, thank you. Maria and May, for your kind words. I'd also like to thank Natalie Bauer and the entire CHC for putting together the wonderful exhibit about my father's life. There are so many familiar faces, musicians, friends, family, who collaborated or supported my father in thousands of ways throughout his life that are here tonight. Thank you for being here. It means so much to my mother and me. When my mother and I thought about how we would remember and commemorate my father, we wanted something more lasting than a bust or a street name. We wanted a living memorial. We wanted to share his life story so that others, especially young Cubans and Cuban Americans, would be inspired to continue his musical legacy. Many of you here might remember him as a teacher, choir director, music minister, or conductor. He was all of these things, but first and foremost, a consummate musician. A precocious musician from an early age, he devoted his studies to music despite his father's wishes. After years of study in Cuba and in Europe, he arrived in Cuba just in time for the revolution. After refusing to participate in the revolution, he came to Miami where they did not know what to make of this Cuban who waved a baton and did not play the bongos. <laughs> Despite his life in exile, the constant lack of money and the skeptics, he remained undaunted as he rebuilt his career, eventually founding the Miami Symphony Orchestra. Like Stravinsky's Firebird, my father always soared again from the ashes. All of us, the children of exile, left behind family, friends, memories, and careers. This is why the mission of the Cuban Heritage Collection is so important. It's more than just paper, they are stories. Many of them lost or forgotten stories that we hope to share with future generations. 
So let me take a moment to give you a virtual tour, so to speak, of a handful of items in the collection over there. First, the photo of my grandmother, Caridad Ochoa. This photo to me signifies devotion. The photo is from an album that along with dozens of items were kept by my tias, Tete and Julita, in an armoire in their room in El Vedado for 37 years until I brought them to Miami in 2003. My father was devoted to his mother and his family and my grandmother Caridad instilled in him his love for music which he learned from a young age. Second, I would like you to take a look at the photo of my father conducting the Belen Jesuit choir. To me, this signifies, as May said, his love for teaching. This choir was the original Cuban version of Glee, for those of you who've seen the show. And like the show, trying out for the choir became a rite of passage at Belen. To this day, I still meet former students who remember him fondly more than 60 years later. Throughout his career, my father taught in schools and as a conductor, he thoroughly enjoyed his visits to schools with members of the Miami Symphony. And in fact, I'd like to take a moment that we have the current conductor of the Miami Symphony, Eduardo Marture. Thank you, Eduardo, for being here today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I think Eduardo is also continuing this program with the schools as well, which is wonderful. Another item that I'd like you to take a look at is the program that's in memoriam of Jose Antonio Echevarria. To me, this signifies patriotism. The death of this university student leader was shocking and sad for youth of that generation. I'm sure many of you in this room might remember that. But music has the power to heal and honor the fallen. We often think of music as an innocuous tool in cultural diplomacy but we often forget how music can be used as a tool for propaganda. When my father refused to play the International, he suffered the price. In another display, you will find the program for the Sarsuela Marina. To me, this signifies his devotion to cultural preservation and Cubania. For my father, it was important to keep alive the musical heritage from Spain and Cuba. This was also the first performance I can remember at the age of three. I can still picture the boat on stage. Jose Lemat, who sang in Marina, among other performances with my father, is also here today. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> in another display, I'd like to call your attention to the first program of the Miami Symphony Orchestra. To me, this signifies his perseverance. The establishment of the Miami Symphony Orchestra was the culmination of a lifelong dream since his arrival in Miami. After the Miami Philharmonic folded, he was convinced that a world-class city like Miami should have its own symphony orchestra. As my father himself said, you need some Don Quixote to create a symphony orchestra. <laughs> he gathered talented local musicians from around the world to not only entertain, but inspire us. The highlight of his tenure with the orchestra was the concert in Carnegie Hall in June of 2000. And you can listen to a clip right outside when you have a moment. Of course, many board members and officials came from Miami, but it meant a lot to me and my mother to share this proud moment with close friends who came that day. Finally, let me point you to the tribute from great David Lawrence then publisher of the Miami Herald. To me, this signifies teamwork and his devotion to my mother. As they say, behind every good man is a good woman, but in this case, she was at his side every step of the way. This dynamic duo worked in tandem to bring the Miami Symphony to life. From costume designer to ticket seller, marketing director, grant writer, operations director, and finally, executive director, my mother, Sophia, has done it all. <laughs> my father always said that, she just made, that he made it easy for him to just stand at the podium and just conduct. In fact, he said that he just needed to give her the baton so she could also conduct. <laughs> Would you also believe 
that she is also a scientist who retired from the University of Miami Medical Campus after almost 40 years in research. My remarkable mother has also spent countless hours organizing my father's papers here at the CHC. So I'd please like to take a moment to give her a hand for all her efforts. But before I end, I would be remiss if I did not thank two special people without whom I would not be standing here today, Esperanza de Varona and Gladys Gomez Rocier. <laughs> Gladys is an old friend and mentor who served as my advisor, and actually I believe is still the advisor, of the board of the Federation of the Federación de Estudiantes Cubanos here at UM. Thanks to Gladys, she introduced me to Esperanza, the CHC's visionary leader for many years. Thanks to her friendship and scholarly guidance, I wrote my master's thesis on La Habana Vieja, which is how I learned about the CHC's rich collection. So I remember Esperanza, and we were on the eighth floor before this wonderful room that we have here today. So thank you, Esperanza and Gladys, for your guidance and friendship. So I hope all of you enjoy the exhibit as well as visit the digital portion of the collection that has music from several of my father's performances. I hope the Maestro Manuel Ochoa collection continues to inspire and educate future generations to become musicians and conductors and keep alive the rich tradition of classical music. Let me end with a few words from Jose Vargas Gomez, a Cuban man of letters who summed up my father this way. Con sus maneras suaves y su hablar pausado, nadie es capaz de imaginar la energía y el poder creativo que se esconde detrás de su personalidad modesta y sencilla. Ochoa es un producto de nuestra cultura. Debemos de sentirnos orgullosos de este gran músico, de inagotable capacidad que contribuye de una manera tan heroica pudiera decirse a la afirmación de nuestros valores artísticos. He also said that my father reminded him of the feat of the old man from the Granite Pampa, as told by José Enrique Rodó. In his book, The Motives of Proteus, who made a tree spring forth from a solid rock, thanks to the tremendous power of his perseverance and will. So let us take this lesson to heart and work to continue to preserve our Cuban heritage and music, along with his firm belief that great music can inspire as well as transform the spirit and the soul. Thank you for coming, and please support the CHC. Amigos of the Cuban Heritage Collection, uh, for the past 20 years, they've been underwriting activities like this one, and we're especially grateful to them for their ongoing support. And I would also like to take the time to thank Sofia Ochoa. Not only did she make it possible for us to um, preserve and make available here Maestro Ochoa's archive, she's given her time as a volunteer, as Manuel mentioned. And she's also introduced us to other donors who have entrusted us with their family materials as well, some of whom are here in the room today. And so with that, Sofia, thank you. If I could ask you to come to the podium, please. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.